Hello, and welcome to the Learning College. My name is Alex Linder, and you can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com. Also post links at pieville.net and kirksvilletoday.com. Today we're going to do chapter six in the Russian Revolutionary Movement of Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together about Russians and Jews. Now, before we begin, I got to explain. The copy I had been using the Columbus Falco translation was missing chapter six through 12. So in recording nine, I did chapter 13 and just a bit of 14. Well, now we got out of space. We jumped from roughly 1885 to 1917. So we got to cover chapter six to 12, cover that time in between. So I had to hunt down a PDF. There's a lot of PDFs out there. It's kind of funny. Now here you have, here you have one of the biggest authors in the world and there's no translation, no official translation of a significant work that he, that he creates. And any work by him would be significant and it would be unthinkable not to translate it into English, but it's not. And so when I looked around, there are translations in French and German, but the English, the official or authorized, I guess you would say, English translation for Solzhenitsyn is dead is going to come out in 2024. Now, the Samzadat underground or unauthorized translations in English are scattered here and there, and a lot of them are missing that chapter 6 to 12 and a couple other chapters as well. So that is the reason, and um, never occurred to me in looking at that book, because it does list all the chapters, but then you get there and all of a sudden it jumps to volume 2, which is where chapter 13 begins. So we still have to, we've done chapters 1 to 5, and chapter 13 and a bit of 14. Now we're going back to do chapter six. So in the end, this will be recording number 10 today, and this will be chapter six, the whole chapter. It's about 30 pages, I believe. But anyway, I found a PDF that has the full translation online. So this is not Columbus Falco today. I don't know who translated this, but uh, we'll see how it how it appears. So again, we're up to about the 1880s, basically, after the chapter five ended with the assassination of Alexander II and the liberalizing reforms. And now we're going to hear about the, the last two decades of the 19th century and the, the beginning of the buildup of the communism and that, that kind of garbage radicalization. So let's begin. Chapter six in the Re Russian revolutionary movement. In the Russian revolutionary movement. In the Russia of the 60s and 70s of the 19th century, the 1860s and 70s, when reforms moved rapidly, there were no economic or social motives for a far-reaching revolutionary movement. Yet it was indeed under Alexander II, from the beginning of his reforming work, that this movement was born as the prematurely ripened fruit of ideology. In 1861, there were student demonstrations in St. Petersburg in 1862, violent fires of criminal origin in St. Petersburg as well, and the sanguinary proclamation of young Russia, Molodaya Rossiya. In 1866, Karakozov's gunshot, the prodromes of the terrorist era, half a century in advance. And he actually does have a lot of footnotes. I am completely ignoring them. They're not in the Columbus Falco, Falco edition. They are in this online PDF, but I'm not going to touch them. And it was also under Alexander II when the restrictions on the rights of the Jews were so relaxed that Jewish names appeared among the revolutionaries. Neither in the circles of Stankiewicz, Herzen, and Ogaryov, all those are footnoted, for example, nor in that of Petrachevsky, there had been only one Jew. We do not speak here of Poland. But at the student demonstrations of 1861, Mikholz, Utin and Gwen will participate, and we shall find Utin, O-U-T-I-N-E, in the circle of Nechayev, N-E-C-H-A-Y-E-V. All these are footnoted again if you get an actual text of this. The participation of the Jews in the Russian revolutionary movement must get our attention. Indeed, radical revolutionary act action became more and more widespread form of activity among Jewish youth. So even as they're liberalizing, the Jews are getting more radical. Even as they're giving Jews privileges and equalities, etc., etc., the Jews are getting more communist and more radical. The Jewish revolutionary movement is a qualitatively important component of the Russian revolutionary movement in general, 
As for the ratio of Jewish and Russian revolutionaries over the years, it surprises us. Of course, in the following pages, we speak mainly of Jews. This in no way implies that there was not a large number of influential revolutionaries among the Russians. Our focus is warranted by the subject of our study, and indeed, as we know from chapter 13, he will say that it was not Jews who were to blame for the initial 1917 revolution, but uh, presumably he'll agree they were responsible for the later 1917 revolution, the February versus the October the Kerensky versus the Bolshevik. In fact, says Solzhenitsyn, until the early 70s, only a very small number of Jews had joined the revolutionary movement and in secondary roles at that, in part, no doubt, because there were still very few Jews among the students. Remember, he a large part of what we heard in the earlier sessions was how Jews were very reluctant to enter general education. A lot of them, most of them, didn't even speak Russian. So hard for them to lead a revolutionary movement until they fully start flushing in there in the 1870s. One learns, for example, that Leon Deutsch, at the age of 10, was outraged about Karakozov's gunshot because he felt, quote, patriotic. Similarly, few Jews adhered to the Russian nihilism of the 60s that, nevertheless, by their rationalism, they assimilated easily. Quote, nihilism has played an even more beneficial role in the Jewish student youth than in Christian youth. However, as early as the early 70s, the circle of young Jews of the rabbinical school in Vilnius began to play an important role. Among them, V. Yokelson, whom we mention later, and the well-known terrorist A. Zundelevich, both brilliant pupils destined to be excellent rabbis, A. Lieberman, future editor of La Pravda of Vienna, and Anna Einstein, Maxim Rahm, R-O-M-M, Finkelstein, this circle was influential because it was in close contact with the smugglers and permitted clandestine literature, as well as illegal immigrants themselves, to cross the border. So Jews are a, a, the international nation. They live in all these other people's countries, and they have networks of their own, and they can facilitate the flow of information, money, uh, goods, and etc., and people, and sex slaves. It was in 1868, after high school, that Mark Natanson entered the Academy of Medicine and Surgery, which would become the Academy, <laughs> the Academy of Military Medicine. He will be an organizer and a leading figure in the revolutionary movement. Soon, with the young student Olga Schleisner, his future wife, whom Tikhomorov calls the Second Sofia Perovskaya, Perovskaya although, although at the time she was rather the first, he laid the foundations of a system of so-called, quote, pedagogical circles, that is to say, of propaganda, parentheses, preparatory, quote, preparatory cultural and revolutionary work with intellectual youth in several large cities. So they're starting to gin up as they get more people into education. They're starting to set up radical communist circles among the students. These circles were wrongly dubbed Tchaikovskyists, named after one of their less influential members, N.V. Tchaikovsky. Natanson distinguished himself very quickly and resolutely from the circle of Nechayev, and he did not hesitate subsequently to present his views to the examining magistrate. In 1872, he went to Zurich with Pierre Lavrov, the principal representative of the, quote, current of Pacific propaganda, which rejected the rebellion, Natanson wanted to establish a permanent revolutionary organ there. In the same year, he was sent to Shenkursk in close exile, and through the intercession of his father-in-law, the father of Olga Schleiser, he was transferred to Vora Voronezh, then Finland, and finally released to St. Petersburg. He found there nothing but discouragement, dilapidation, inertia. He endeavored to visit the disunited groups, to connect them, to weld them, and thus founded the first land and freedom organization, and spent hundreds of thousands of rubles. Among the principal organizers of Russian populism, Natanson, N-A-T-A-N-S-O-N, is the most eminent revolutionary. Among the main organizers of Russian populism, Natanson is the most eminent. It was in his wake that the famous Leon Deutsch, D-E-U-T-S-C-H, it was in his wake of Natanson that the famous Leon Deutsch appeared. As for the ironclad populist Alexander Mikhailov, 
He was a disciple of, quote, Mark the Wise. Natanson knew many revolutionaries personally, neither an orator nor a writer. He was a born organizer, endowed with an astonishing quality. He did not regard opinions and ideology. He did not enter into any theoretical discussions with anyone. He was in accord with all tendencies, with the exception of the extremist positions of Tikhachev, Lenin's predecessor, T-K-A-C-H-E-V, and placed each and every one where they could be useful, so a pure organizer, he's saying. In those years when Bakunin supporters and Lavrov supporters were irreconcilable, Natanson proposed to put an end to, quote, discussions about the music of the future, unquote, and to focus instead on the real needs of the cause. It was he who, in the summer of 1876, organized the sensational escape of Pyotr Kropotkin on the, quote, barbarian, that half-blood who would often be spoken of. In December of the same year, he conceived and set up the first public meeting in front of the Cathedral of Our Lady Kazan, of Kazan at the end of the Mass on the day of St. Nicholas. All the revolutionaries gathered there, and for the first time, the red flag of lit land and liberty was displayed. Natanson was arrested in 1877, sentenced to three years' detention, then relegated to Yakutia, and dismissed from revolutionary action until 1890. Again, all this is footnoted, so that's Natanson, a real true organizer. There were a number of Jews in the circle of Tchaikovskyists in St. Petersburg, as well as in its branches in Moscow, Kiev, Odessa. In Kiev, notably, P.B. Axelrod, whom we have already mentioned, the future Danish publisher and diplomat Grigory Gurevich, future teacher Semyon Lurie, or Lowry, L-O-U-R-I-E, and Lizer Lowenthal, his brother Naaman, Naaman, or Naaman Lowenthal, and the two Kaminer sisters. As for the first nihilist circle of Leon Deutsch in Kiev, it was, quote, constituted exclusively of young Jewish students. The first nihilist circle of Leon Deutsch in Kiev, exclusively young Jews. After the demonstration in front of the Cathedral of Our Lady of Kazan, three Jews were tried, but not Natanson himself. At the trial of the 50, quote-unquote, which took place in the summer of 1877 in Moscow, several Jews were charged for spreading propaganda among factory workers. At the trial of the 193, unquote, there were 13 Jews accused. Among the early populists, we can also cite Losif Aptek, Aptekman, Losif Aptekman and Alexander Katinsky, who were highly influential. Aptek Man and Kotinsky, Nathanson, Leon Deutsch, Jew populist revolutionaries early in the, in the proceedings. Nathanson's idea was that revolutionaries should involve the people, peasants, and before them, like lay spiritual guides. This, quote, march to the, to the people, which has become so famous since then, march to the people under Nathanson, began in 1873 in the Dolgushinian circle, Dolgushin, Demakovsky, Gamov, etc., where no Jews were counted. Later, the Jews also, quote, went to the people, unquote. The opposite also happened in Odessa. P. Axelrod tried to attract Jaliabov in a secret revolutionary organization, but he refused. At the time, he was still a, a Kultertrasser, not sure what that is. Culture is culture in German. Trosser, I'm not sure what that would be. In the mid 70s, there were only about 20 of these, quote, populist, all or almost all, Lavrov and not Bakunin. I guess those were the two sides Lavrov, L A V R O V, and Bakunin, a famous uh, nihilist. Only the most extreme were listening to calls for the insurrection of Bakunin, such as Deutsch, who, with the help of Stefanovich, had raised the Chigurin revolt by having pushed the peasants into thinking that the Tsar, surrounded by the enemy, had the people saying, turn back all these authorities, seize the land, and establish a regime of freedom. It is interesting to note that almost no Jew Jewish revolutionary launched into the revolution because of poverty, but most of them came from wealthy families. These Jew revolutionaries are wealthy, not poor. 
In the three volumes of the Russian Jewish Encyclopedia, there is no shortage of examples. Only Paul Axelrod came from a very poor family, and as we have already said, he had been sent by the Kahal to an institution solely to supplement the established quota. From there, very naturally, he entered into the he entered the gymnasium of Mogilev, then the high school of Najin. Came from wealthy merchant environments, Natanson, Deutsch, Aptekman, whose family had many Talmudists, doctors of law, including all his uncles, Kotinsky, Gurevich, Semyon Luri, or Lowry, whose family, even in this milieu, was considered aristocratic. Quote, Little Simon was also destined to be a rabbi, but under the influence of the Enlightenment, his father, Gertz, or Gertz Lowry, had entrusted his son to college to become a professor. So these are rich uh, rabbinic families that are supplying most of the revolutionaries. The first Italian Marxist, Anne Rosenstein, surrounded from childhood by governesses speaking several languages, like uh, Freud and such. The tragic figures of Moses Rabinovich and Betty Kamenskaya, Felicity <laughs> Cheftel, Joseph Gutsov, members of the Black Reparation, among many others. And then again, Christina Kajia Grinberg, quote, of a wealthy traditionalist merchant family, who in 1880 joined the Will of the People. Her dwelling housed clandestine meetings. She was an accomplice in the attacks on Alexander II, and even became, in 1882, the owner of a clandestine dynamite factory, then was condemned to deportation. Neither did Fanny Morinus come from a poor family. She also, quote, participated in the preparations of attacks against Emperor Alexander II, and spent two years in the prison of Kara. K-A-R-A. Some, all this is footnoted, of course. Some came from families of rabbis, such as the future doctor of philosophy, Leobov Axelrod, or Ida Axelrod. There were also families of the petty bourgeoisie, but wealthy enough to put their children through college, such as Azik Aronchik. After college, he entered the School of Engineers of St. Petersburg, which he soon abandoned to embark in revolutionary activities. Alexander Biebergal, Vladimir Bogoraz, Lazarus, Lazarus Goldenberg, the Lowenthal brothers, often mention is made in the biographies of the aforementioned of the Academy of Military Medicine, notably in those of Natanson, Biebergal, Isaac Pavlovsky, future revolutionary M. Rabinowicz, A. Katinsky, Solomon Chudnovsky, Solomon Aronson, who happened to be involved in these circles, among others. So, big center of Jew revolutionary activity is, oddly enough, the Academy of Military Medicine. Therefore, it was not material need that drove them, but the strength of their convictions. It is not without interest to note that in these Jewish families, the adhesion of young sons to the revolution has rarely, or not at all, provoked a break between, quote, fathers and sons, between parents and their children. And he says, rarely have, has doing this extreme stuff that can land you in prison or make you disrespected, rarely has that provoked a break between parents and children, meaning that Jews are thoroughly radical people, at least in relation to Goy society. Whereas that would not be the case where whites involved in white nationalism very frequently are broken from their parents or kids or whatever because of their views, whether by the state or, but also the people just being scared. There's a big difference there. Loyalty. Quote, the fathers did not go after the sons very much, as was then the case in Christian families, although Gezia Gelfman had to leave her family, a traditional old alliance family, in secret. The, quote, fathers were very often very far from opposing their children. Thus, Gwertz Lowry, as well as Isaac Kaminer, a doctor from Kiev, the whole family participated in the revolutionary movement of the 70s, and himself, as a, quote, sympathizer, rendered great service, unquote. To the revolutionaries. Three of them became the husbands of his daughters. In the 1990s, he joined the Zionist movement and became a friend of Akkad Ham. Neither can we attribute anti-Russian motivations to these early Jewish revolutionaries as some do in Russia today. In no way! Exclamation point. It all began with the same, quote, nihilism, unquote, of the 60s. Quote, Having initiated itself to Russian education and to Goy culture, having been imbued with Russian literature, quote, 
Jewish youth was quick to join the most progressive movement of the time, nihilism, and with an ease all the greater as it broke with the prescriptions of the past. Even, quote, the most fanatical of the students of a yeshiva, Jewish high school, immersed in the study of the Talmud, after, quote, two or three minutes of conversation with the nihilists, broke with the, quote, patriarchal mode of thought. Quote, he, the Jew, even pious, had only barely grazed the surface of Goy culture. He had only carried out a breach in his vision of the traditional world, but already he was able to go far, very far, to the extremes. These young men were suddenly gripped by the great universal ideals, dreaming of seeing all men become brothers and all enjoying the same prosperity. The task was sublime, to liberate mankind from misery and slavery. Maybe, maybe not. And there played the role of Russian literature. Pavel Axelrod, in high school, had as his teachers Turgenev, Bylinsky, Dobroliubov, and later La Salle, who would make him turn to the revolution. Aptek man was fond of Chernyshevsky, Dobroliubov, Pisarev, and also Buckle. Lazar Gold Goldenberg, too, had read and reread Dobroliubov, Chernyshevsky, Pisarev, Nekrasov, and Rudin, who died in the barricades, was his hero. Solomon Chudnovsky, a great admirer of Pisarev, wept when he died. The nihilism of Semyon Lowry was born of Russian literature. He had fed on it. This was the case for a very large number. The list would be too long. But today, a century later, there are few who remember the atmosphere of those years, the 1860s. No serious political action was taking place in this, quote, street of the Jews, as it was then called, while in the street of the Russians, populism was rising. It was quite simple. It was enough to, quote, sink and merge into the movement of Russian liberation. Now, this fusion was more easily facilitated, accelerated by Russian literature and the writings of radical publicists. By turning to the Russian world, these young people turned away from the Jewish world. Many of them conceived hostility and disdain to the Judaism of their fathers, just like towards a parasitic anomaly. In the 70s, quote, there were small groups of radical Jewish youths who, in the name of the ideals of populism, moved more and more away from their people, began to assimilate vigorously, and to appropriate the Russian national spirit. Until the mid-70s, the socialist Jews did not consider it necessary to do political work with their fellow men because, they thought, the Jews had never possessed land and thus cannot assimilate socialist ideas. The Jews never had peasants of their own. Quote, None of the Jewish revolutionaries of the 70s could conceive of the idea of acting for one's own nation alone. It was clear that one only acted in the dominant language and only for the Russian peasants. Quote, for us, there were no Jewish workers. We looked at them with the eyes of Russifiers. The Jew must assimilate completely with the native population, unquote. Even artisans were regarded as potential exploiters since they had apprentices and employees. In fact, Russian workers and craftsmen were not accorded any importance as an autonomous class. They existed only as future socialists who would facilitate work in the peasant world. Assimilation, once accepted, these young people, by their situation, naturally tended towards radicalism, having lost on this new soil the solid conservative roots of their former environment. But again, you know, these, these Jews, if, if when the, traditional Judaism was exploiting the peasants, so I don't know if you want to call that solid conservative roots. Again, but again, Solzhenitsyn is a, is a Christian, and that colors... It colors everything that he says, and so the mistakes of the Christians are going to be his mistakes. Quote, we were preparing to go to the people, and of course to the Russian people. We denied the Jewish religion like any other religion. We considered our jargon an official artificial language, and Hebrew a dead language. We were sincere assimilators, and we saw in the Russian education and culture salvation for the Jews. Why then did we seek to act among the Russian people, not the Jewish people? It comes from the fact that we had become strangers to the spiritual culture of the Jews of Russia and that we rejected their thinkers who belonged to a traditionalist bourgeoisie 
from the ranks of which we had left ourselves. We thought that, when the Russian people would be freed from the despotism and yoke of the ruling classes, the economic and political freedom of all the peoples of Russia, including the Jewish people, would arise. And it must be admitted that Russian literature has also somewhat inculcated the idea that the Jewish people were not a people, but a parasitic class. Also came into play the feeling of debt owed to the people of Great Russia, as well as, quote, the faith of the populist rebels in the imminence of a popular insurrection. In the 70s, quote, the Jewish intellectual youth went to the people in the hope of launching with its feeble hands the peasant revolution in Russia. As Aptek Man writes, Natanson, like the hero of the Mitsiri of Lermontov, knew the hold of only one thought, knew the hold of only one thought, lived only one but burning passion, from Lermontov, M-T-S-Y-R-I, I guess a poem. This thought was the happiness of the people, the passion, the struggle for liberation. Aptek man himself, as depicted by Deutsch, was, quote, emaciated, of small stature, pale complexion, with very pronounced national features, I don't know if that means a hook nose or what, having become a village nurse, he announced socialism to the peasants through the gospel. It was a little under the influence of their predecessors, the members of the Dolgushan circle, whom inscribed on the branches of the crucifix, quote, in the name of Christ, liberty, equality, fraternity, and almost all preached the gospel, that the first Jewish populist turned to Christianity which they used as a support point and as an instrument. Jews using Christianity to overcome Russia. Aptek Man writes about himself, quote, I have converted to Christianity by a movement from the heart and love for Christ. Not to be confused with the motives of Tan Bogoraz, who in the 80s had converted to Christianity, quote, to escape the vexations of his Jewish origin nor with the feint of Deutsch who went to preach the Molokanes by presenting himself as a good Orthodox. But, adds Aptek Man, in order to give oneself to the people, there is no need to repent. With regard to the Russian people, quote, I had no trace of repentance. Moreover, where could it have come from? Is it not rather for me, the descendant of an oppressed nation, to demand the settlement of this dealing instead of paying the repayment of some, I am not sure which, fantastic loan? Nor have I observed this feeling of repentance among my comrades of the nobility who are walking with me on the same path. Let us note in this connection that the idea of a rapprochement between the desire and socialism and historical Christianity was not unconnected with many Russian revolutionaries at the time, and as justification for their action, and as a convenient tactical procedure, V. V. Flerovsky, F. L. E. R. O. V., wrote, quote, I always had in mind the comparison between this youth who was preparing for action and the first Christians, and immediately after, the next step. By constantly turning this idea into my head, I have come to the conviction that we will reach our goal only by one means, by creating a new religion. It is necessary to teach the people to devote all their forces to oneself exclusively. I wanted to create the religion of brotherhood. And the young disciples of Florosky tried to, quote, lead the experiment by wondering how a religion that would have neither God nor saints would be received by the people. His disciple Gamov from the circle of Dolgushin wrote even more crudely, we must invent a religion that would be against the Tsar and the government. We must write a catechism and prayers in the spirit. The revolutionary action of the Jews in Russia is also explained in another way. We find it exposed and then refuted by A. Srebrenikov. There is a view that if through the reforms of the years 1860 to 1863, the Pale of Settlement had been abolished, our whole history would have unfolded otherwise. If Alexander II had abolished the Pale of Settlement, there would have been neither the Bund nor Trotskyism. Then he mentioned the internationalist and socialist ideas that flowed from the West and wrote, quote, If the suppression of the Pale of Settlement had been of capital importance to them, 
all their struggle would have stretched towards it. Now they were occupied with everything else. They dreamed of overthrowing Tsarism. And one after the other, driven by the same passion, they abandoned their studies, notably the Academy of Military Medicine, to, quote, go to the people. Every diploma was marked with the seal of infamy as a means of exploitation of the people. They renounced any career, and some broke with their families. For them, quote, every day not put to good use constitutes an irreparable loss, criminal for the realization of the well-being and happiness of the disinherited masses. But in order to go to the people, it was necessary to make oneself simple, both internally for, for oneself and practically to inspire confidence to the masses of the people. One had to infiltrate it under the guise of a workman or a mujik. I think that means peasant. However, writes Deutsch, how can you go to the people, be heard and be believed, when you are betrayed by your language, your appearance, and your manners? And still, to seduce the listeners, you must throw jokes and good words in popular language. And we must also be skillful in the work of the field, so painful to townspeople. For this reason, Katinsky worked on the farm with his brother and worked there as a plowman. The Lowenthal brothers learned shoemaking and carpentry. Betty Kamenskaya entered as a worker in a spinning mill to a very hard position. Many became caregivers. Deutsch writes that, on the whole, other activities were better suited to these revolutionary Jews. Work within factions, conspiracy, communications, typography, border crossing. The, quote, march to the people began with short visits, stays of a few months, a, quote, fluid, unquote, march. At first they relied only on the work of agitation. It was imagined that it would suffice to convince the peasants to open their eyes to the regime in power and the exploitation of the masses and to the promise that the land and the instruments of production would become the property of all. In fact, this whole march to the people, always in quotes, of the populists, ended in failure, says Solzhenitsyn. The march to the people of the populist, and not only because of some inadvertent gunshot directed against the Tsar, Solovyov, 1879, which obliged them all to flee the country and to hide very far from the cities, but above all because the peasants, perfectly deaf to their preaching, were even sometimes ready to hand them over to the authorities. The populist, the Russians, hardly more fortunate, like the Jews, lost, quote, the faith in the spontaneous revolutionary will and in the socialist instincts of the peasantry, and, quote, transformed into impenitent pessimists. Clandestine action, however, worked better. Three residents of Minsk, Losif Gutsov, Saul Levkov, and Saul Grinfest, succeeded in setting up a clandestine press in their city that would serve the country as a whole. What was St. Paul's first name? Saul Grinfest, Saul Paul, Saul Levkov. So the Jews set up a clandestine press that served the whole country. It survived until 1881. It was there that was printed in gold letters, the leaflet on, quote, the execution of Alexander II. It printed the newspaper, the Black Repartition, and then the proclamations of the will of the people, capital letters. Deutsch referred to them as, quote, peaceful propagandists. Ha! Early example, like, see, a mostly peaceful riot is, became famous in, 19, uh, tw in 2021 as the Jews on CNN were lying about uh, the blacks and destroying various things. Well, here you go. Deutsch referred to them as peaceful propagandists. Apparently the term, says Solzhenitsyn, peaceful embraced everything that was not bombing smuggling, illegal border crossing, and even the call to avoid paying taxes appealed to the peasants of Lazar Goldenberg. Many of these Jewish revolutionaries were heavily condemned, heavily even by the measures of our time. Some benefited from a reduction of their punishment, like Semyon Lowry, thanks to his father who obtained for him a less severe regime in prison. There was also public opinion which leaned towards indulgence, Aptek Man tells us that in 1881, after the assassination of Alexander II, quote, they lived relatively freely in the prison of the Krasnoyarsk, where, quote, the director of the prison, a real wild beast, 
was suddenly tamed and gave us all kinds of permissions to contact the deportees and our friends. Then, quote, we were received in transit prisons, not as de detainees, but as noble captives. Quote, the prison director came in, accompanied by soldiers carrying trays with tea, biscuits, jam for everyone, and as a bonus, a small glass of vodka. Was it not idyllic? We were touched. Close quote. The biographies of these early populists reveal a certain exaltation, a certain lack of mental equilibrium. Leo Deutsch testifies. Leon Zlat Zlatopolsky, a terrorist, quote, was not a mentally balanced person. Aptek man himself in his cell after his arrest, quote, was not far from madness as his nerves were shaken. Betty Kamenskaya, quote, from the second month of detention lost her mind. She was transferred to the hospital. Then her father, a merchant, took her back on bail. Having read in the indictment that she would not be brought before the court, she wanted to tell the prosecutor that she was in good health and could appear, but soon after she swallowed poison and died. Moses Rabinovich, in his cell, quote, had hallucinations. His nerves were exhausted. He resolved to feign repentance to name those whom the instruction was surely already acquainted with in order to be liberated. He drew up a declaration promising to say everything he knew, and even, upon his release from prison, to seek and transmit information. The result was that he confessed everything without being released, and that he was sent to the province of Irkutsk, where he went mad and died, quote, barely over the age of 20. Jewish mental problems, eh? Examples of this kind are not lacking. Lizer Zuckerman immigrated to New York and put an end to his life. Naaman Lowenthal, after having immigrated to Berlin, was sent into the dizzying downward spiral of a nervous breakdown, to which was added an unhappy love. Quote, he swallowed sulfuric acid and threw himself into the river at the age of about 19. These young individuals had thrown themselves away by overestimating their strength and the resistance of their nerves. And even Grigory Goldenberg, who in cold blood, had defeated the governor of Kharkov and asked his comrades, as a supreme honor, to kill by his own hand the Tsar. But his comrades, fearing popular anger, had apparently dismissed him as a Jew. Apparently this argument often prompted populists to designate, most often Russians, to perpetrate attacks. After, <laughs> So they're ringleaders, but they're staying in the background while the, while the Russians, they radicalized and do the dirty work. After being arrested while carrying a charge of dynamite, he was seized by unbearable anguish in his cell of the Trubetskoy bastion. His spirit was broken. He made a full confession that affected the whole movement, petitioned that Aaron Zundelvich come share his cell, who showed more, more indulgence than others toward his actions. When it was refused, he committed suicide. So a lot of these were kind of weak-minded, it seems. Others who were not directly involved suffered, such as Moses Edelstein, who was by no means an ideologist who had slipped, for a price, clandestine literature. He suffered much in prison, prayed to Yahweh for himself and his family. He repented during the judgment. Quote, I did not imagine that there could be such bad books. Or S. Aronson, who, after the trial of the, quote, 193, disappeared completely from the revolutionary scene. Another point is worthy of noting. It was the facility with which many of them left that Russia which they had long ago intended to save. In fact, the 70s emigration was regarded as desertion in revolutionary circles. Even if the police seek you, go underground, but do not run away. Tan Bogoraz left to live 20 years in New York. Lazar Goldenberg, Detroitman, also left in New York in 1885, where he gave classes on the history of the revolutionary movement in Russia. He returned to Russia in 1906, after the amnesty, to leave again rather quickly to Britain, where he remained until his death. Why, they just get all over the place, don't they? They always seem to have rights to do so. They always seem to have places they can get publish, uh, <coughs> publishing jobs or political jobs or preaching jobs or whatever they want. It seems to be completely open to them. They have a valid working network. In London, one of the Vayner brothers became the owner of a furniture workshop, and Mr. Aronson and Mr. Rahm became clinical doctors in New York. 
After a few years in Switzerland, I, Gudsov, went to live in America, having radically broken with the socialist movement. Lizer Lowenthal emigrated to Switzerland, completed his medical studies in Geneva, became the assistant of a great physiologist before obtaining a chair of histology in Lausanne. Semyon Lowry also finished his studies in a faculty of medicine in Italy, but died shortly after. Lyubov Axelrod, the Orthodox, his nickname, remained for a long time in immigration, where he received the Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Berlin. Later, he inculcated dialectical materialism to students of Soviet graduate schools. A. Kotinsky also entered the Faculty of Medicine of Bern, but died the following year from a galloping consumption. Grigory Guraryev, <coughs> Guraryev made a fine career in Denmark. He returned to Russia as the country's ambassador in Kiev, where he stayed until 1918. All this shows how many talented men there were among these revolutionaries. Men such as these, endowed with such lively intelligence, when they found themselves in Siberia, far from wasting or losing their reason, they opened their eyes to the tribes which surrounded them, studied their languages and their customs, and wrote ethnographic studies about them. Leon Sternberg on the Gilyaks, Tan Bogoraz on the Chouchkis, Vladimir Yokelson on the Yukagirs, and Naom Gukur on the physical type of the Lakuts. Some studies on the Buryats are due to Moses Kroll. Some of these Jewish revolutionaries willingly joined the socialist movement in the West. Thus, V. Yokelson and A. Zundelevich, during the Reichstag elections in Germany, campaigned on the side of the Social Democrats. Zundelevich was even arrested for having used fraudulent methods. Anne Rosenstein in France was convicted for organizing a street demonstration in defiance of the regulations governing traffic on the street. Turgenev intervened for her and she was expelled to Italy where she was twice condemned for anarchist agitation. She later married F. Turati, converted him to socialism, and became herself the first Marxist of Italy. Anne Rosenstein. Abraham Valt Lessine, hyphenated, a native of Minsk, published articles for 17 years in New York in the Socialist Organ of America, Vorwärts, German word meaning forward, out of New York, and exerted a great influence in the formation of the American labor movement. That road was going to be taken by many others of our socialists. So essentially the communist scum of, of Russia is coming over to the U.S., as we well know. It sometimes happened, <coughs> excuse me, it sometimes happened that revolutionary emigrants were disappointed by the revolution. <clears throat> Thus, Moses Veller, having distanced himself from the movement, succeeded, thanks to Turgenev's intervention with the Loris Melikov, to return to Russia. More extravagant was the journey of Isaac Pavlovsky, living in Paris as, quote, illustrious revolutionary, unquote, he had connections with Turgenev, who made him know Emile Zola and Alphonse Daudet. He wrote a novel about Russian nihilists that Turgenev published in the Vestnik Europe, The Messenger of Europe, and then he became the correspondent in Paris of Novoye Vremya, the New Times, under the pseudonym of I. Yakolev, and even, as Deutsch writes, he portrayed himself as, quote, anti-Semite, unquote, sent a petition in high places, was pardoned and returned to Russia. That said, the majority of the Russian, or the, the majority of the Jewish revolutionaries blended in, just like the Russians, and their track was lost. Quote, with the exception of two or three prominent figures, all my other compatriots were minor players, writes Deutsch. A Soviet collection published the day after the revolution under the title of, quote, historical and revolutionary collection, unquote, quotes many names of humble soldiers unknown to the revolution. We find there dozens, even hundreds of Jewish names. Who remembers them now? However, all have taken action. All have brought their contribution. All have shaken more or less strongly the edifice of the state. Let us add, this very first contingent of Jewish revolutionaries did not fully join the ranks of the Russian revolution. All did not deny their Judaism. A. Lieberman, a great connoisseur of the Talmud, a little older than his populist fellow students, 
proposed in 1875 to carry out a specific campaign in favor of socialism among the Jewish population. With the help of G. Gurevich, he published a socialist magazine in Yiddish called Emes, Pravda Equals Truth, in Vienna in 1877. Shortly before, in the 70s, A. Zundelevich, quote, undertook a publication in the Hebrew language, unquote, also entitled Truth. El Shapiro hypothesizes that this publication was, quote, the distant ancestor of Trotsky's The Pravda. Pravda meaning truth, the ideological or noble truth. The tradition of this appellation was durable. Some, like Valt Lassine, hyphenated, insisted on the convergence of internationalism with Judaic nationalism, having it both ways. In his improvised conferences and sermons, the prophet Isaiah and Karl Marx figured as authorities of equal importance. In Geneva was founded the Jewish Free Typography, intended to print leaflets addressed to the Jewish working class population. Specifically, Jewish circles were formed in some cities. A, quote, statute for the organization of a social revolutionary union of the Jews of Russia, close quote, formulated at the beginning of 1876, showed the need for propaganda in the Hebrew language and even to organize between Jews of the Western region, quote, a network of social revolutionary sections federated with each other and with other sections of the same type found abroad. The socialists of the whole world formed a single brotherhood and this organization was to be called the Jewish Section of the Russian Social Revolutionary Party. Hessen comments, The action of the Union among the Jewish masses, quote, has not met with sufficient sympathies, and that is why these Jewish socialists and their majority, quote, lent a hand to the common cause, that is to say, to the Russian cause. In fact, circles were created in Vilnius, Rodno, Minsk, Dvinsk, Odessa, but also, for example, in Eltz, Saratov, and Rostov-on-Don. In the very detailed founding act of this, quote, Social Revolutionary Union of All Jews in Russia, one can read surprising ideas, statements such as, quote, Nothing ordinary has the right to exist if it has no rational justification. By the end of the 70s, the Russian revolutionary movement was already sliding towards terrorism. The appeal to the revolt of Bakunin had definitely prevailed over the concern for instruction of the masses of Lavrov. So there you have the two tendencies in the <coughs> in uh, the nihilism. Go to the people and instruct the masses, says Lavrov, and, and blow things up, and says Bakunin. Beginning in 1879, the idea of populist presence among the peasants had no effect. The idea that dominated in the will of the people, capital TWP, gained the upper hand over the rejection of terror by the black repartition. Terror, nothing but terror, much more a systematic terror, that the people did not have a voice in the matter, that the ranks of the intelligentsia were so sparse, did not disturb them. Terrorist acts, including against the czar in person, thus succeeded one another. According to Leo Deutsch's assessment, only 10 to 12 Jews took part in this growing terror, beginning with Aaron Gobst, G-O-B-S-T, executed, Solomon Wittenberg, prepared an attack on Alexander II in 1878, executed in 1879, Isaac Aronchik was involved in the explosion of the imperial train, condemned to a penal colony for life, and Gregory Goldenberg, already named. Like Goldenberg, A. Zundelevich, brilliant organizer of terror, but who was not given the time to participate in the assassination of the Tsar, was arrested very early. A. Zundelevich was arrested very early. There was also another quite active terrorist, Mladetsky, M-L-O-D. As for Rosa Grossman, Christina Grinberg, and the brothers Leo and Savelli Zlatopolsky, they played a secondary role. In fact, Savelli, as of March 1, 1881, was a member of the executive committee. As for Gezia Gelfman, she was part of the basic group of the, quote, 
actors of March 1st, unquote. Then it was the 80s that saw the decline and dissolution of populism. Government power took over. Belonging to a revolutionary organization cost a firm eight to ten years of imprisonment. And firm, they're using that in the British sense. We don't use that in American English, but a firm just meaning like a group of people like out to rob a bank or something or, you know, any, any group basically. But if the revolutionary movement was caught by inertia, its members continue to exist. One can quote here Sophia Ginsburg. She did not engage in revolutionary activity until 1877. She tried to restore the will of the people, which had been decimated by arrests. She prepared, just after the Ulyanov group, an attack on Alexander III. So-and-so was forgotten in deportation. Another was coming back from it. A third was only leaving for it, but they continued the battle. Thusly was a famous deflagration described by the memorialists, the rebellion in the prison of Yakutsk, in 1889. An important con con <coughs> contingent of political prisoners had been told that they were going to be transferred to Verkhoyansk and from there even further to Sredny Kolimsk, which they wanted to avoid at all costs. The majority of the group were Jewish inmates. In addition, they were informed that the amount of baggage allowed was reduced. Instead of five pods of books, clothes, linen, five Poods or P-O-O-D-S, I don't know what that is, also of bread and flour, two pods of meat, plus oil, sugar, and tea, the whole, of course, loaded onto horses or reindeer, or are going to send these kikes way out into Siberia, basically, a reduction of five poods in all. The deportees decided to resist. In fact, it had already been six months they had been walking freely in the city of Yakutsk, and some had obtained, obtained weapons from the inhabitants. Quote, while you're at it, might as well perish like this, and may the people discover all the abomination of the Russian government, perishing so that the spirit of combat is revived among the living. When they were picked up to be taken to the police station, they opened fire on the officers, and the soldiers answered with a salvo. Condemned to death, together with N. Zotov, were those who fired the first shots at the vice governor, L. Kogan Bernstein, and A. Gaussman. Note a lot of German and Jew names in here. Condemned to forced labor in perpetuity were the memorialist himself, O. Minor, the celebrated M. Gotz, and also Gurevich and M. Orlov, Mr. Branson, Mr. Bragwinski, Mr. Fundaminsky, Mr. Uffland, S. Ratin, O. Estrovich, Sophia Gurevich, Vera Gotz, Paula per Pauline Perley, A. Bolatina, and Kogan Bernstein. The Jewish Encyclopedia informs us that for this mutiny, 26 Jews and 6 Russians were tried. That same year, 1889, Mark Natanson returned from exile and undertook to forge, in place of the old dismantled populist organizations, a new organization called the Right of the People, Narodnodyoy Pravo. Natanson had already witnessed the emergence of Marxism in Russia, imported from Europe, and its comp competition with populism. He made every effort to save the revolutionary movement from decadence and to maintain ties with the liberals. Quote, the best liberals are also semi-socialists. Not more than before did he look at nuances of convictions. What mattered to him was that all should unite to overthrow the autar autocracy, and when Russia was democratic, then it would be figured out. But the organization he set up this time proved to be amorphous, apathetic, and ephemeral. Besides, respecting the rules of the conspiracy was no longer necessary. As Isaac Gurevich very eloquently pointed out, because of the absence of conspiracy, a mass of people fall into the clutches of the police, but the revolutionaries are now so numerous that these losses do not count. Trees are knocked down and chips go flying, so there was a lot more people in these circles so that the arrest of some didn't matter as much, and they didn't need to conspire, they were doing this openly now as we move on in the 1880s. The fracture that had occurred in the Jewish consciousness after 1881-1882, that is the assassination of Alexander II, period after that, could not but be reflected somewhat in the consciousness of Jewish revolutionaries in Russia. These young men had begun by drifting away from Judaism, and many had returned to it, only if you see it as a religion, culture, rather than a racial thing. 
they had left the street of the Jews and then returned to their people as they always, always, always do, no matter what the talk is about one world, brotherhood of man, or uh, any kind of a racial ism that Jews are, are perpetrating or promoting, they always go back to their own. Quote, our entire historical destiny is linked to the Jewish ghetto. It is from it that our national essence is forged. Until the pogroms of 1881-1882, after the assassination, absolutely none of us revolutionaries thought for a moment, unquote, that we should publicly explain the participation of the Jews in the revolutionary movement. But then came the pogroms, which caused, among the majority of our countrymen, an explosion of indignation. And now, quote, it was not only the cultivated Jews, but some Jewish revolutionaries who had no affinity with their nation, who suddenly felt obliged to devote their strength and talents to their unjustly persecuted brothers. The pogroms have awakened sleeping feelings. They have made young people more susceptible to the sufferings of their people and the people more receptive to revolutionary ideas. Let this serve as a basis for an autonomous action of the Jewish mass. Quote, we are obstinately pursuing our goal, the destruction of the current political regime. But behold, the unexpected support to the anti-Jewish pogroms brought by the leaflets of the will of the people. Leo Deutsch expresses his perplexity in a letter to Axelrod, who also wonders, quote, The Jewish question is now, in practice, really insoluble for a revolutionary. What would one do, for example, in Balta, where the Jews are being attacked? To defend them is tantamount to a, quote, arousing hatred against the revolutionaries who not only killed the Tsar, but also support the Jews. Reconciliation propaganda is now extremely difficult for the party. This perplexity, P.L. Lavrov himself, the venerated chief, expresses it in his turn. Quote, I recognize that the Jewish question is extremely complex, and for the party, which intends to draw itself closer to the people and raise it against the government, it is difficult in the highest degree because of the passionate state in which the people find themselves and the need to have it on our side, in italics. He was not the only one of the Russian revolutionaries to reason this way. In the 80s, a current reappeared among the socialists advocating direct attention advocating and directing attention and propaganda to specifically Jewish circles and preferably ones of workers. But, as proletariat, there were not many people among the Jews, some carpenters, binders, shoemakers. The easiest was certainly to act among the most educated printers. Isaac Gervich recounts, with Moses Kurguin, Leon Rogaller, Joseph Resnick, quote, in Minsk, we had set ourselves the task of creating a nucleus of educated workers. But if we take, for example, Belastok or Grodno, quote, we found no working class. The rec recruitment was too weak. So the Jews are too much in professions or tradesmen or something. There, there are a few workers who are carpenters, binders, shoemakers, and, but, and some printers. But beyond that, not much of a working class, not much tradesmen. The creation of these circles was not done openly. It was necessary to conspire either to organize the meeting outside the city or to hold it in a private apartment in the city, but then systematically beginning with lessons of Russian grammar or natural sciences, and then only by recruiting volunteers to preach socialism to them. As I. Martyr explains, it was these preliminary lessons that attracted people to the revolutionary circles. Quote, skilled and wise, capable of becoming their own masters, quote, those who had attended our meetings had received instruction there, and especially mastery of Russian, for language is a precious weapon in the competitive struggle of petty commerce and industry. After that, our, quote, lucky guys, unquote, freed from the role of hired laborers and sweating to their great gods that they themselves would never employ hired labor, had to have recourse to it due to the requirements of the market. Or, once formed in these circles, quote, the worker abandoned his trade and went away to take examinations externally. The local Jewish bourgeoisie disliked the participation of young people in the revolutionary circles, for it had understood, faster and better than the police, where all of this would lead. <laughs>
Here and there, however, things advanced. With the aid of socialist pamphlets and proclamations provided by the printing press in London, the young revolutionaries themselves drafted, quote, social democrat formulations on all programmatic questions. Thus, for ten years, a slow propaganda led little by little to the creation of the Bund. That's a German word for association. But, quote, even more than police persecution, it was